Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. So those of you who've been with us uh, through the last several Sundays, you know that we've been moving in a series of messages we call The Promise of Christmas. And um, I've said it before, I think it's worth repeating, and that is that God is, is very passionate about Christmas. Uh, matter of fact, he's, uh, he's what I would call an enthusiastic, over-the-top celebrator of Christmas. And the reason why I say that is because he started talking about the event, not days or weeks or months or even years before it came, but rather God started heralding um, the beauty, the power of Christmas centuries, even thousands of years before it ever arrived. That's how excited God was about Christmas. And of course, you see this in the Bible, that out of the 400 prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about the, uh, the, the person of Christ, Uh, Out of 400, at least a third of them have to do with his birth. And so it's almost like God was saying, hey world, it's time to get ready, it's time to get excited, it's time to pull out all the stops and start celebrating uh, because Christmas is coming. And as I said, God did it centuries and millennia before it ever came into being. Uh, He promised Christmas. And through this series, we've been looking at those promises The promises in the Old Testament that point to this marvelous event called Christmas. Uh, We started off with what I called the promise of his purpose, the prevailing nature of Christmas, that despite all the things that were going on in the world at that time, um, Christmas still came. Uh, Last week, those of you who were here, we talked about the, uh, the promise of his presence, and that regardless of where we might find ourselves, In the good days, in the bad days, on the mountains, in the valleys, God promises us that he is our, what, Emmanuel. He's always with us. And so that's where we've been so far in this series. This morning we're going to move on and and we're going to look at what I call the promise of his power. His power. Let's say that together. His power. The promise of his power. And so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, either turn them on or turn them to uh, a very remote part of the Old Testament. And the reason why I call it remote is that uh, uh, there's a good chance many of us don't get there very much. And that is none other than the book of Micah. Uh, Micah chapter 4. And if you're wondering where the book of Micah is, it's about halfway in the middle of the Bible. And so if you take the Old Testament, New Testament, go about halfway, uh, you'll find the book of Micah there. And we're going to be looking at some scripture there in this very um, uh, remote area of the Old Testament. And, um, uh, you know, I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation for those of you who uh, use a Bible app, have access to a variety of versions. Uh, But uh, if you're familiar with the book of Micah at all, uh, particularly uh, this chapter here, the fourth chapter, uh, you'll know that it's a a beautiful description of what the Bible calls the millennial reign of Christ. And that is actually the thousand-year reign of Christ when um, after the great tribulation, when Jesus comes on a white horse, his saints are following behind him, and he sets up his kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. And uh, that's what this chapter is all about. And you can see it here in verse 1. It says, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on the earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. And so, of course, what this is talking about, the mountain that Mike is referring to, really isn't a mountain at all. But rather, it's talking about a a city. The the city is called the New Jerusalem. And this is the place that Jesus will live and reign here on earth. Um, It goes on to tell us some of the things that are going to be happening in this incredible city. Look at here. People from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out of Jerusalem. 
In other words, what uh, the prophet is telling us is that the knowledge and the awareness of God will flow unhindered. Out of this city, it'll go forth. And people from all different nations who are still living here on the earth will come to the city to hear God's word. It goes on to say this, the Lord will mediate between people and will settle disputes between strong nations far away. They will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will no longer fight against nations nor train for war anymore. In other words, this is a glorious picture of the promise of peace. Of peace. It says, it says that there will be no more war. And, and how many of you know in a world that has only known war, from the very beginning of humanity itself, all we have ever known is war and brutality and violence. And so it's almost inconceivable to think that something like this could happen, that there will be no more strife or conflict. That's one of the promises of the millennial kingdom. And then in the next verse, it says, everyone, let's say that together, everyone, everyone will live in peace and prosperity, enjoying their own grapevine and fig trees, for there will be nothing to fear. The Lord of heaven's army has made this promise. And so what we have here is really a a time when heaven comes to earth. And because heaven has come to earth, there'll be no more sickness, there'll be no more disease, no more suffering, no more pain, no more calamities, no more disasters. Uh, This will be a time of peace and harmony and prosperity and abundance, and it'll flow freely to all those who live on the earth at that time. And of course, for those of us who bear the name of Christ, Uh, Those of us who uh, uh, call Jesus our Lord and Savior, we are eagerly awaiting and looking forward to this time. We really are. I hope you are. I know I am. Um, But this is a promise that God has given us. And yet the question is, is just how do we get there? So in other words, how do we get from here? And if you're wondering where here is, that's Calgary. Um, how many recognize the picture? How do we get from here to here? And here is the, uh, the millennial city. How do we get there? How do we get to that place? You know, that is the question. Uh, how do we move from where we're at now to this wonderful place where there's prosperity and healing and tranquility and peace? Well, you know, the answer to that question is is, 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 is first, we answer it by first stopping at a very small and humble place. And you might be wondering just where that small and humble place is. Well, you know, the prophet Micah talks about it in the very next chapter, chapter 5, 5 verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judea. Yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from the distant past. It says, but you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village. Let's say that phrase together, small village. Small village. One translation says, you, O Bethlehem, are are little among the thousands in Judah. Another one says, O you, O Bethlehem, are too small to be included among the cities of Judah. And yet another one says, but you, Bethlehem, are just the runt of the litter. I like that, just the runt of the litter. And you know, that's exactly what Bethlehem was. It was a small, little farming community located about five miles south of Jerusalem. And although it boasted of having some rather famous inhabitants throughout history, uh, for instance, uh, Saul, who was the very first king in Israel, he came from Bethlehem. And of course, uh, David, uh, who was the greatest king in all of Israel, he came from Bethlehem. And so uh, Bethlehem did have some very famous and important inhabitants, but compared to all the other cities, the towns in the nation of Israel, Bethlehem always remained rather tiny and small. It was just a humble farming community carved out of the rolling hills of Judea. And yet we see here that despite its rather small and inconsequential reputation, something very special 
Something very earth-shaking was going to happen in this little humble place called Bethlehem. And you see it here. It says, yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from the distant path. How many think you know who this is talking about? What's his name? This is Jesus. It's talking about Jesus. And in other words, this run to the town uh, would, 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 would give birth to a king whose origins come from way, way in the past. Of course, we know this to be Jesus. And the reason we know it's talking about Jesus is because 800 years after this prophecy was given, a handful of shepherds in the very same rolling hills in which this uh, prophetic word was declared. We know the story. They were out in their field. They were keeping watch over their flock by night when all of a sudden an angel appeared to them and said this, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in where? In Bethlehem. Uh, the city of David. In other words, what God was saying is this tiny little insignificant runt of a town uh, is going to house one of God's, the greatest work that God has ever done. This runt of a town is going to manifest the glory of God in, in a way that no other place ever has because in this little town of Bethlehem, a Savior is going to be born and his name is Christ. And you know, when I look at this story, this prophecy, and this promise, what, what, what I get is, is, is I call it the power of the small. That oftentimes God takes the weakest and seemingly most insignificant things of this world, he takes the small things, and out of them he performs the greatest and most glorious work imaginable. That is the principle that we're looking at here in this promise today. What God can do with small little things. What God can do with the runt of the litter, you see this principle all through the Bible. When it came time for God to raise up a nation, who did he go to? Not a young couple, not a fertile couple, not a newlywed couple. When God wanted to raise up a nation for himself, who did he go to? He went to Abraham and Sarah, a couple that were well along in their years. Um, not only were they well along in their years, Sarah, even when she was young, couldn't bear children. She was barren. I'll tell you, if I was planning to raise up a nation, a powerful nation on the face of the earth, I would have never gone to a, in, in a barren woman, never mind a barren woman who was past bearing age, 90 years old, and yet God comes to this old, weak couple. And says, I'm going to birth a nation out of you. Your, your descendants will be as the sand of the sea. That is the power of the small. Of course, you also see it really with the story of David, right? We're familiar with that, right? Samuel, the prophet, comes to anoint the next king over Israel. And he tells Jesse, his, the father, line up all your sons in front of me. And I'm going to stop in front of every one of them. And when, when the God tells me which one it is, then I'll anoint him as king. And so Saul lines up, uh, Jesse lines up all his sons, and Samuel goes from one to the next to the next to the next, and not one of them is the one that should be anointed. And Samuel the prophet is confused, he scratches his head, and he looks at Jesse and he says, don't you have any more sons? And Jesse said, oh yeah, we got one. We didn't even invite him to the anointing party. He's the run to the litter, little David, out looking after the sheep. And Samuel says, run quickly, go get him. And David comes, and as soon as Samuel the prophet sees this little skinny kid called David, God says he's the one, and God anoints David. Little David is king over Israel. It's called the power of the small, and God specializes in doing that. Right? He specializes in taking the insignificant and the weak and the lowly and raising them up, filling them with his purpose and power. And you know, you might be here this morning feeling a little bit small in this world. Maybe you're wrestling with feelings of insignificance. 
right? And you're wondering, you know, where do I have a place? Why would God ever use me? Little old me. You need to realize that those are the very ones God is looking for. He puts his hand on the weak and the lowly. That is the principle all through the Scripture, not only through Scripture. You know, that principle shows up over and over again in the story of Christmas. That when it came time for God to step out of heaven and enter this world, how did he do it? He didn't come as a king. He didn't come as a ruler. He didn't come as a monarch to sit on a throne. When God chose to visit this planet, he came through a helpless little baby born to a poor Jewish teenager from a small dusty town called Nazareth. You talk about humble. You talk about an utterly remarkable entrance that the God of the universe would come to earth in the form of a helpless little baby. That's what I call the power of the small. And then finally, when it came time for the news of his birth to be broadcasted, this is always amazes me, God sent an angel where? Not to Herod's palace where the news of, of, of the birth of Christ could be talked about and reposted everywhere. Not, not to the, 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 the Jewish temple in Jerusalem where the keepers of the law and the re- religious uh, uh, traditions lived. God didn't come to the, to the Herodians, who were the wealthy and influential of that day, really the movers and the shakers. We see that when it came time for God to announce the glorious birth of Christ, God didn't go to the rich or the famous or the powerful, but rather he came to a handful of poor, lowly shepherds out in a field in the evening, keeping watch over their flock. It was the most unlikely audience to such incredible news that you could ever imagine. And we know the story. The angel said, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you'll recognize him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped in snuggling strips of cloth lying in a manger. You know, we're familiar with this story. We're familiar with these verses. You know, I like how one Bible translation, The Voice, puts this particular verse. It says, today in the city of David, a liberator has been born for you. He is the promised anointed one, the supreme authority. And then look at what it says in the very next statement. How will you know that you have this liberator? You will find him when you see a baby wrapped in a blanket lying in a feeding trough. Right? It hardly makes any sense at all. Right? These words don't even line up together. Liberator, anointed one, the supreme authority. He is coming how? As a baby, wrapped in a blanket, lying in a trough that animals eat out of. It's almost unimaginable to think that the God of the universe would show up in such a lowly and humble way. And yet it reminds us again how God works, okay? And he wants to work in your life. How God works is that God uses the small, God uses the weak, God uses the ordinary and the plain in this world to manifest his grandest, most powerful work through. That is the power of the small. And of course, many of us have heard this principle talked about over and over again. And yet, there's still something inside of us that is unwilling to believe and embrace it. There's just something, there's a a blockage inside of us. And the reason why I say that is because many of us, uh, myself included, often live our lives plagued. We're, We're plagued and paralyzed by what I call the I'm not and I'm too mentality. We get plagued by it. I'm not and I'm too. And you might wonder, well, what kind of mentality is that? Well, I'll show you. These are the things that we get plagued with. The I'm not mentality says I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not spiritual enough. I'm not cool enough. And then you can personalize it by filling in the blank yourself. I'm not this and I'm not that. And because of all that I'm not, God could never use me. That's what I call the I'm not mentality. 
And if that isn't bad enough, we are then bombarded with what I call the I'm too kind of thinking. And the I'm too kind of thinking says I'm too stupid. I'm too ugly. I'm too shy. I'm too old. No, wait. I'm too young. I'm too broken. I'm too faulty. I'm too weak. And then you can fill in the blank for yourself. Because we get very good at those kinds of things. It's all that negative self-talk. It's the I'm not and the I'm too. And the truth is that many of us spend our entire lives, I want you to hear me this morning, dominated and controlled by this kind of thinking. And that's why it's so important that we begin to understand and and get a grasp on on the beauty of Bethlehem. Right? The message of Bethlehem. Because as we spend our lives going around telling ourselves and God why we are simply too broken and too sinful and too flawed and unqualified to ever be used of him, he answers back by saying this. He tells us to quit bashing and beating ourselves up. Why? Because we are the very ones Right? As broken and bruised and, and, and sinful and flawed as we are, we are the very ones whom God wants to put his grace and power upon. How many believe that this morning? Turn to the person next to you and say, I think this is talking about you. God takes the little runs, the broken and the flawed ones, and places his greatest power upon it. Of course, Paul talks about this in, first, in Corinthians 1.26. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes. Or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things that the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think that they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chooses the things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and use them to bring to nothing that the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. And so what we see here are the qualities God is looking for when it comes to choosing the kinds of people he wants to use and place his power on. And I think many of us would fit those qualities very well. I know I would, not very wise, not very powerful, those who don't have it all together, those who haven't had it all figured out, that that God is in what I call the perplexing habit of choosing the weak and the flawed and the little runts to display his greatest acts of grace and power through. It's called the beauty of Bethlehem. The beauty of Bethlehem, the power of the small. And this morning what I want to do is, um, in closing, I want to just give you three quick keys that will help you be used of God more frequently and more powerfully in this. Because I think that some of us have disqualified ourselves from being used of God in bigger ways because we've seen ourselves so small And so flawed when God is saying, that is exactly what I am looking for. And so the first key this morning is we need to learn to celebrate who we are. Celebrate. And when I say celebrate, I'm not talking about throwing a party for yourself and announcing to all the guests that are there just how wonderful and glorious you are. You know, I'm having a party to celebrate myself, and I just want to let everyone, hey, can I get everybody's attention for I'm a jolly good fellow? That's not what I'm talking about. When I say celebrate, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about embracing a mentality of compassion and acceptance for who you are. It's an attitude that says, Lord, I might not be perfect, and I might not have it all together, but I know one thing, that even in the worst state that I get in, you still love me, you still value me, you still consider me precious in your sight. That's how we celebrate ourselves. It's understanding that although we might have weaknesses and deficiencies and limitations, uh, we also have these things called gifts and talents and strengths and abilities as well. Well, 
And that God wants to take all of us, the good things and the bad things. And because of the blood of Jesus and the grace that he extends to us, he bypasses our weaknesses and he uses them to house his great power and anointing. That is the beauty of Bethlehem. And that means that out of the seven and a half billion people who now live on this planet, we come to the realization that there's no one exactly like me. That I am unique, and because I am unique, because I am a unique creation of God, I am both loved beyond measure. I am, I am treasured and I am precious in God's sight. And that is called celebrating yourself. Muting, silencing all the negative, demeaning self-talk that we tend to say to ourselves. All the, the I'm nots and the I'm too, and, and, and firmly grounding our identity in God's grace, his forgiveness, and what he has to say about us. Amen? You know, the second one is we uh, celebrate ourselves, or we also surrender what I have. And in other words, we take whatever we might have. Now, you might say, well, I don't have very much. Well, you don't have to have very much. When Jesus went to feed the, the, the multitudes, what did he use? He didn't have very much. It was just the, 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 a little boy, just a little runt, just a little boy who showed up to the event, five loaves and a few fish, and, and, and he surrendered it into the hands of Christ. And when Christ took those loaves and broke them, that was when the power was released. That's what surrender is all about. And you know, that's exactly what Mary did when the angel came to her with the news that she was going to conceive and give birth to the Christ child. She didn't argue. She didn't complain. She didn't say, God, that's impossible. I've not known anyone. But rather, when Mary heard the news that God wanted to use her, a little Jewish teenage girl, to give birth to the Savior of the world, what did she say? She said, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. That's a statement of surrender, right? God, I can't figure it all out. doesn't make any sense to me. It just doesn't add up. I can't connect the dots. But one thing I'm willing to do is surrender. I am your servant, Lord. And whatever you say about me and, and to me and, and whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, Lord, I am willing to surrender all that I am, all that I have for you, for your glory and for your purposes. That is is the power of the small. And then, of course, the last one, you celebrate who you are, surrender what you have, and then lastly, believe that God will use me. In other words, regardless of how weak or deficient or broken or flawed we might feel, listen to me, we choose to stand in faith, right? Stand in faith and believe that, that God can, can even use me. God will use me. He will anoint me. He will direct me. He will pour his blessing out on me, not because of anything that I am, but everything that he is. And so I just believe that God is going to use me. And I want you to ask yourself, when's the last time you believed that? When's the last time you believe that God would use you in a more significant way? When is the last time you believe that God was going to cause you to be a light in a dark place, a bearer of hope in this hopeless world? I think some of us have disqualified ourselves. We, we said, well, I'm not worthy enough. I'm, I'm not enough, or I'm too much of this. And, and, and yet God says, you're the very thing I need in this hour. for me to share my message and my love. It's the power of the small. Paul said that very thing in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He, uh, you might, you, 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 many of us are familiar with it. Paul wound up with a thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what the thorn was. But whatever it was, it, it, it caused great hindrance in his life. It restricted him. And, 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 and Paul says, I prayed three times that God would take my thorn away. 
And yet this is the answer I got back from Jesus. Each time Jesus said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. This is what Paul says. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. It's the power of the small. You know, I love how the Phillips translation puts this verse. It says, therefore, I have cheerfully made up my mind to be proud of my weaknesses because they mean a deeper experience with the power of Christ. I, can't even, I can even enjoy weaknesses, suffering, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake. Listen to this. For my very weaknesses make me strong in him. That's the beauty of Bethlehem. That God takes all that we're not and fills it with all that he is. So that, that we can step out and do what he's called us to do. And so I want us to begin to receive that power this morning. Open up our hearts this morning. Dare to believe that God could take me, the run to the litter. And I want you to think about, some of you have grown up in a family where, where, where you were talked down against. Family members, teachers told you that you're, you'll never succeed, you'll do nothing significant. And you've carried that thing. And yet you need to understand that out of that very weak spot, that place of of, of weakness and, 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 and limitation, God releases his grace and power. Amen. And God will do the same thing as in us if we'll just open ourselves up to him. And so I'm going back to the question again. How do you get from here to here? Here to here? You stop at the little town of Bethlehem. You stop at a place and say, God, I'm tired of of putting on a mask. I'm I'm tired of hiding my weaknesses and my flaws. And I'm gonna open up myself to you and freely surrender all that I am in your hands so that you can use me in any way you wish. And so I want us to stand this morning And I want us to personally stop at this little town. You might say, well, how do we do that? Well, you you meet God in your weak place. And I know that some of us here this morning, we've been struggling with all kinds of weaknesses. It's almost like our weaknesses plague us. They keep us up at night. And yet we, we, we come to a place, right, where, where we accept our weaknesses because we are bathed in the, the love and grace of God. And so I want us to hold our hands like this as an act of surrender. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the power of Bethlehem because it reminds us, Lord, just how gracious and forgiving just how loving and compassionate you are that you come into our weak lives, our dark places. You come to us, we who are sinful and broken. You come to us. And in us and through us, you birth some glorious and wonderful things. And so, Lord, we ask that you would come as we step into this Christmas season Father, may you use us as your carriers of light and grace and hope to this lost and broken world. And Father, we thank you for it. We pray it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, let's give the Lord a clap offering. Amen.